We're live. Mm -hmm. Hi. People always filter in at 12, and I talk for a couple of minutes. So, um, so I'll go ahead and get started on this. Um, where did we? I lost our speaker. Is he stepped out? Anyway, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's coming up at CoMotion Labs. I don't know how many of you are, have been here before. Thank you for finding Fluke Hall, those of you who have never been in Fluke Hall before. We are one of three startup incubators on the University of Washington campus. Um, this startup incubator focuses specifically on, uh, on physical engineering startups because we have lab space downstairs. There's also Startup Hall over on Northeast Campus Parkway. They focus on software and IT uh, and with a emerging focus on fintech, cryptocurrency, and AI. And then we have another startup incubator uh, over at Comotion HQ, which is right over by the um, Trader Joe's, for those of you who know where that is. And that one is focused almost entirely on VR and AR. Uh, they're really interesting to tour. We do have monthly tours. If you check out our webpage and you look at our events, you'll see that those are coming up and you can sign up for them or just show up for them. And we tour people through regularly. A uh, few things that are coming up next Tuesday on February 4th, 13th at Comotion HQ, just before Valentine's Day, perfect timing. You can get an overview of the angel investing process. Uh, we all need that for Valentine's Day. Um, that is being done in uh, combination with Seattle Angel Conference. Somebody asked me uh, at one point whether or not I'd signed up for Seattle Angel Conference, and I was like, no, I'm not an angel. I did not know that Seattle Angel Conference, silly me, is among other things uh, a place where uh, startups pitch to angels. And so they are doing a whole series of workshops over at Comotion HQ prepping startups to pitch at Seattle Angel Conference. So if you have a startup and you want to get prepped to pitch at Seattle Angel Conference, uh, look us up. Go over to Seattle HQ, uh, Comotion HQ on Tuesdays uh, for the next several weeks, and they will prep you so that you can do as well as you possibly can do. Thursday, February 15th, in this, in this building we focus, like I said, on physical engineering, and we have an especially big focus on um, health tech, uh, biotech, med tech. Uh, so we also are working in combination with Cambia Grove downtown who are sort of trying to reinvent the healthcare system in the United States. Uh, they are doing something called the Five Points Conference and every week for a couple of hours they talk about different aspects of uh, health technology and, and the health sector. Uh, Thursday the 15th they're going to be talking about the payer, a better understanding of how the payer interacts with the healthcare system and an introduction to primary stakeholders and how to position your solution. So that's really good if you're in that field. And then Friday, back in this space, doing this all again, we're going to be talking about blockchain with Ryan Strauss, and we're going to be very lucky to have him. He's amazing. Uh, he's done a ton of stuff with blockchain. Look him up. He uh, most recently is working over at, as a school of law professor for Seattle University, talking about crypto and in, in the law school. So it's, it's really great. Today, uh, after this lecture, we're also going to have a lecture coming from the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic here at the University of Washington. The Entrepreneurial Law Clinic gives free and low-cost legal services to entrepreneurs um, via law school students. Uh, the fantastic program. They're all overseen by, by lawyers uh, who work with startups focused um, here in the Seattle area. They're fantastic. They're going to be doing corporate basics after this, and I've seen their presentation. It looks great. I wish somebody had done it for me when I got into startups. And today, um, we have, uh, I'm going to, I'm sorry, we, normally we meet beforehand and instead we were running around and I'm going to, I'm going to butcher your name. <laughs> you want to say it? E. Jane. And it's embarrassing that I don't know E. Jane. He's a uh, managing, um, uh, he's one of the managers over at, uh, um, the Alliance of Angels, and he's been so active in the Seattle startup community, and he's one of those names that I've seen over and over and over and over again, and I've never had the opportunity to get to know him. He is a managing director of Alliance of Angels, a network engineer by training. Yi Jing stumbled into the startup world when AT&T rebooted its corporate venture fund and recruited him as a founding team member. Working with entrepreneurs and helping them build their companies turned out to be so amazing that he continued that work at Microsoft. Uh, then he became a venture capitalist at Sierra Ventures, focused on investments in mobile and infrastructure uh, all over the world. He has an MBA here uh, with the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell. 
we're so excited to have him. And I'm just got so sorry I didn't get to meet you beforehand, but I'm really looking forward to this presentation because I think nobody knows startup valuation. Uh, it all looks like voodoo to everyone else. And now we're gonna find out how it really works. Okay, so I just want to make sure the sound is working all right for the folks. So thanks for everyone for coming this afternoon, really appreciate it. Uh, one, one quick thing about this session, we are actually um, streaming, we are taking video and we are streaming to Spokane as well, where Comotion has a facility. So there are some entrepreneurs watching there as well. Uh, we try and make this interactive. If you have questions, we welcome it from the audience. But please remember, we have people, we have people who are listening to the stream. So wait for the microphone to come to you before asking your question. So, so everyone, everyone on the video can, can hear what you are saying. And also a big thank you to Commotion for hosting these events, providing all the lovely food at the back. Hopefully you've gotten a chance to get some bagels and, and soda. Uh, this is a, a community events. The Alliance of Ages is a not-for-profit organization and we try and do as many of these things as possible to help out the local startup community. And also thanks to our partners, Commotion, for hosting this. Much appreciated. Alrighty, so um, let's go ahead and get started. Let me see. A uh, little bit about the group that I'm with, the Alliance of Angels. So there are 140 angel investors in my group. And every year we put about $10 million into 20 companies. So most companies that are fundraising from us are looking for somewhere between a total of 500K to 1.5 million. And our typical check size is in the 250K to 5. Is this on? Give us a sec. Is this red one working? Yes. Okay, cool. All righty. Okay. Right, so our, our check size, the Alliance of Angels typically invest somewhere in the order of 250K to 500K into a round that's of a total size of um, half a mil to 1.5. And we are generally a sector agnostic organization, although about half our investments are in IT, about a quarter are in consumer, and the rest are in life sciences, hardware, energy, energy and everything else. We are a uh, PAC Northwest focused group. So we invest primarily in companies headquartered right here actually in Seattle. More than 90% of our companies are in the Seattle region, and most of the remainder are either in Vancouver, BC up north, or in Portland, Oregon down south. And if folks are fundraising, would like to learn more about the Alliance of Angels in the process, feel free to come find me afterwards. I'm going to be around for a bit. All right, and as I mentioned earlier, the A of A is actually a normal profit organization. Uh, we have our members pay dues to support the group, and we also have all these people that want to sell stuff to entrepreneurs. Uh, if you are interested to learn more about them, uh, feel free to send me a note, reach out to them directly. Uh, also, kind of a, a sidebar that I usually mention. Um, if you're out there uh, fundraising, and you come across organizations that say, hey, you know, we, 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 we can have you pitch in front of our rich investors, but you have to pay this giant fee or something like that. Think, think very carefully about it. There, there, there are definitely organizations that are kind of uh, not necessarily in the entrepreneur's best interest. So if you hear about this kind of pay-to-pitch groups, especially if you're an IT startup, uh, it is very unlikely that such venues are the, the best place necessarily for you. So consider that very carefully, at least for the Alliance of Angels, that there's never any fee for entrepreneurs to come and approach us uh, for, for fundraising. And uh, just again, be, be aware, there are many platforms and other, I guess, a bit of unsavory underbelly of the organization that's really out to make money from entrepreneurs as opposed to get money into your pockets. All right. So today we're going to be talking about startup valuation. And I want to mention that today's presentation is primarily targeted at situations where you are raising money for your fundraising for your startup. Okay, and generally for the situation where you are raising for the first time. So right now the company is entirely owned by yourself or your co and your co-founders and employees. There's no outside money in it. So that's what primarily the content of this workshop is directed at. Uh, there are a few other places whereby uh, valuation tends to be mentioned. One of them is when you're selling the company. Uh, th those are situations whereby uh, if 
which are usually handled by an investment banker or if you're selling a smaller kind of business, maybe a business broker. Uh, th those are situations which generate a very different number versus a number when you're fundraising. Uh, typically because uh, when a company is thinking about buying potentially your company, they're thinking about some synergies that they could get and the additional, uh, what, what they, the additional value that could be added by taking your technology, your product and put into the distribution channel. So they are like to pay a lot more versus say what um, a valuation may come out for fundraising. So just one, one thing to think about, if you are out there fundraising for, for your company and saying that, well, Google said they'll pay 50 million for my company, so therefore it's worth 50 million dollars now, it's not usually the, the, uh, the right way to, to think about uh, starting a fundraising conversation. Um, separately, the, another situation where you might be thinking about valuation is your pricing options for your employees. Now, if, if, that, if that's the reason why you came to this workshop, you, you really are in the wrong place. I can, I can refer you to a CPA who can take care of that kind of thing for you. I am not a CPA. I'm not qualified to speak on such things. And there are a lot of tech, new tax laws, I understand, with the new, uh, the new bill that passed last year. So um, if, if that's was something that you're interested in, uh, fear, uh, again, I can refer you to someone else. But this is not something that we're going to be covering today. Okay. All right. So when it comes to startup valuation, I, I, w w it often seems to be something that's very much shrouded in mystery, right? You, you get um, people mysteriously will have like two guys and a dog in the garage and they're worth five million or 10 million. Like, huh, well, how, how did that happen? And, and then we have, and then when, when you ask many investors or ask other people, so, so how, how, how do you come up with this number? And they say, oh no, valuations and art, you know, it's kind of like wishy-washy. And that, that's generally, I'm, I'm not found to be a very helpful guidance for, for entrepreneurs, especially if you're raising money for the first time. So, so what, what, I, what I want to try and distill and make it, make it simple and very actionable, for, especially for someone who's uh, new to this, uh, a, a very helpful way to think about um, how, how to value your company. You start with two questions that uh, are relatively simpler to answer. One of them is how much money do you need to raise? Right? And the second is how much of your company are you planning to sell? So if you think about it mathematically, if you have both of these together, you can actually back into a valuation. This would be third or fourth grade math. Uh, let's start with the first question, which is uh, something that we, we encourage all entrepreneurs to think very carefully about. Sometimes I go to the Techstar Seattle program or to other accelerators, and I discover that everybody is raising 750000 or 1 million or some number, and we ask them, how do you get that number? And oh, you know, because my classmates are raising it too, or my lawyer told me it's how much I raise. That, that's probably that's really not the right answer that, that you want to deliver. Uh, the, the amount that you need to raise, right, what we tell, what we suggest to all our entrepreneurs is to raise enough to be able to hit the operating metrics necessary to raise the next round of capital. Mo most companies are thinking of a further round, a Series A or three or five million dollars after an angel round. So the way to do it is go talk to the next stage investors, people that were, you think would be interested in the next round of investment and ask them, what do you want to see before you will give me your $5 million check, $3 million check, wh wh whatever number you are targeting for the next race. Okay? And they would typically, for, 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 a, for a company at that, to get that size check, you typically need to have some kind of concrete operating metric. Right? For angel and seed deals, you can kind of do like stardust and rainbows and, and get people to connect the dots. Any people will invest, right? But for the later stage things, you really need to have some hard things. And for if you're a SaaS kind of company, there's often a, like a, a ARR or monthly recurring revenue or annual recurring revenue targets that you need to hit. Or maybe uh, maybe X number of customers. Or if you're a medical device company, you need to have passed certain gates in the FDA process. It does vary depending on the kind of business. And make sure you ask what are the metrics that you need to hit. And once you know what the metrics are, that's your goal, right? So you need to make sure you have enough money in your company to be able to reach that goal. And the way to do it is to create essentially an 18-month financial plan, month by month, right? So you, you, you pencil every single month, and then you, you know what the end point is. Maybe it's a million dollars annual recurring revenue, whatever. And you know, to be able to get there, let's say I need to finish the product, so I need to hire developers, you know, I, I need to do a certain amount of marketing, and maybe you're doing Facebook or Google or that kind of thing. Maybe you're going to trade shows, whatever, right? And then you just build it into the budget, and then you have month by month, about 18 months, and you sum 
you bring it all down and then you sum all the negative numbers and that's roughly what you need to raise. Right? So it is an important exercise to go through. Uh, building a company is a lot of work, a lot of time, so uh, take some time to plan the journey <laughs> and not, not, not just uh, kind of blunder or, or, or jump straight into it. And you will find that if you have taken the time to model this kind of thing out, uh, when you go into diligence investors, it's very frequently something that people are going to ask and you already have it and you have the assumptions behind it and that makes you look very good versus saying that I'm raising 750k because my textiles classmate is raising 750k which is really, really, really not a good answer. Okay. Um, another, another consideration in terms of how much you need to raise is also to make sure that you have enough time to execute the plan. So you, let's say you know the goal, it's a million dollars annual recurring revenue. It usually takes a minimum amount of time, usually 12 to 18 months to be able to make meaningful progress towards a goal. Right? M many entrepreneurs are very optimistic. You think you'll get uh, you know, $5 million in your first reel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's great to be optimistic, but statistically, it's something that's relatively rare for a company to grow really quickly or to make significant progress in a very short period of time. Analogy is a little bit like having a baby. Right? You, you can't put more resources and then get the baby to come up faster. It, it doesn't quite work like that. There are certain kind of physics involved in, um, in, 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 the, in the journey to building a company. So make sure you give yourself enough time, say 12 to 18 months, enough, enough time, and also enough fuel, enough money to be able to hit those, um, to be able to hit the necessary metrics. So something to always think about. Um, some general guidance, right? If, if you are a software company, it is very unlikely that you would be able to make significant progress on less than $500,000 in general, right? And in anything less than that, and you're probably looking at a friends and family kind of round, it's not really an angel or seed round at that point. Um, and for, if you're doing a hardware company, you're doing a life science company, it's very common for such companies to raise multi-million dollars in the first round because they, hardware companies are harder. It, it, takes, it takes more capital. You can't just, for example, for medical device companies, you can't decide, well, the market didn't work out. Let's just change and sell it to a different market. It, it, you, you can't really do that for, for medical device companies. But if you're doing a software business, you, you have more flexibility. So make sure you have directionally the amount of capital that you need to be able to fuel you. It doesn't, you, you, it is never a good idea to cross the desert halfway, right? If you don't raise, the most common reason companies die is they run out of money, right? And the very common reason for not for running out of money is you didn't figure out your goals and you didn't raise enough. So what happens is that you got halfway to the metrics you need to raise your next round and then you're out of money. So you can't raise your next round. Then you've got to go back to your, old invest, your, your existing investors and say, hey, can you just give me a little bit more? I want to extend the bridge, you know, that kind of thing. And that's what's a very awkward conversations to have. It's always easier to make sure, you know, right now when you're kind of fresh and the shiny new thing and you can really kind of uh, get people to connect the dots on how things are going to work to get all the money in right now and then get to work and hit the metrics as opposed to kind of like mother through halfway and then run out of money and have to kind of refuel halfway through. Those, those tend to be extremely difficult and could cause the company to go away. All right. Um, there is a second kind of company sometimes that we see wh where, whereby um, it's more, it, it falls more in what's sometimes described as a lifestyle business. I, I don't necessarily like the way this is. This. The vast majority of small businesses in America never raise angel or venture capital, right? Uh, it's like 99%. And these are perfectly fine. If, the, if, the, if your objective of building your business is to provide cash flow for yourself and your family, and so that's perfectly okay. And in many of those cases, the goal is just to get to cash flow positive. I and mean, that's also a reasonable uh, goal to be able to, to, to target towards. And for many companies that are of that nature, where they're not trying to be the next Google, but you want to build a five or $10 million business and get a good cash flow out of it, those are usually situations that are structured where you have um, uh, kind of a dividend payout. And uh, so you'll pay down your investors over time until eventually they're all paid off after a certain multiple. So that's a, a very different type of company. But if you're in that bucket, that, that's how, kind of how you will look at it. But again, the vast majority of companies that I see that are angel investors see are those that want to become the next Google. They, they want to scale quickly. And it's really about you know, what are the metrics I need to hit, uh, make sure I have 18 months of fuel, and make sure you have the number right to get there. Okay? Does anyone have any questions? Any questions about this? Anyone? Okay. 
So let, let's go on to the, the second part of this is how much of the company do you typically sell? So I, I can make this quite simple. If you, have, if you own the entire company now and this is your first time out raising like a quote unquote outside institutional round, not the friends and family round, but uh, from people you don't know and it's the largest check more than 500k, you will typically sell about 20% of your company. This, this is quite typical. And uh, it's not, this is not my opinion, to be clear. Th th this is based on a, a, lot of, a lot of data stretching back many, many years. Right? So it's going to be roughly that. There's always going to be a range, of course. Um, it tends to be somewhere between what 15 and 35, some, somewhere in that ballpark. But a very simple way of doing the math is uh, uh, around 20%, give or take. So if you have decided, for example, that um, your, your, uh, your, your company is worth, a mil you need a million dollars, of, uh, of capital, right? If you're selling 20% of it, it means that the company before investment is worth four million. It's a very simple way to back, back into it. And again, it's a very, very common thing in the, in the generous Seattle market for companies to really say a million dollars on a four million pre-money valuation, which is the value of the company uh, before, the, before the cash comes in. Now, there, there, are some, there, there are some concerns. There's, there's something that you have to be very careful about. You, you, you don't want to sell too much of your company too soon. If this is the first round you're raising and you're selling half your company, I, this is a really bad idea. And it's not just bad for you. Obviously, it, 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 it may seem that to the investor's side, this is a real great deal, right? Uh, but that's actually not true either. For <coughs> in order for this kind of thing to work, investors and early stage investors and entrepreneurs, you, you generally have to work in a happy kind of partnership. There has to be alignment on interest. That you have to have enough of the company for it to be worth your wow, you know, and we have to be able to have a decent return on the capital on the investor side. If you have, if you give away too much of your company too soon, <coughs> then there's, there's a lack of, it just, it's just not, there's just not enough um, skin in the game on your side to be able to take this to the finish line. I mean, I can give some examples. I've seen companies, especially in markets where you have um, what we call like naive investors and naive entrepreneurs, often like in Vancouver up north, sometimes in Portland, whereby companies come along and they have raised one round in the past and the investors own 95% of the company and the entrepreneurs own 5%. Right? And you look at something like that, it's like just, 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 just totally unvi unviable. Because even if there's a great exit and so forth, the, the, what, what's in it for the entrepreneur is just too little. So, so think, think carefully about um, Think carefully about how, your di how, how the company gets diluted over time. There is another side to this, and <coughs> it sounds you meet the entrepreneur that wants to keep control. So I always want to have 75% of my company, 51%, or, or some, some particular number. The thing to think about this is, um, you know, the idea here is that you, you want to bring in capital to be able to grow the pie, so overall it works and it grows for everybody. Having 75% of something that's worth Zero is still zero. Uh, the, if you can bring in money and make the, the pie worth a larger number, that's going to be the benefit for everyone. So that, that's kind of like how, how, how to conceptually think about it. As you, and as you raise capital, this is not the only round that you raise. You'll be raising additional rounds going forward, and each time you raise, <coughs> you're going to be diluted. Excuse me. Um, you're going to get diluted down. <coughs> um, <coughs> you're going to get diluted down over time. So you have to be real careful when you think about um, not giving away too much of your company too early. So th there's a really helpful um, site called ownyourventure.com that you can try taking a look up. And it has within it a modeling too. So you can say, I raised my first round. It's a million dollars in the four million pre-money. And then you raise your next round. Right? Maybe it's a 5 million or 10 million pre-money. So as you go along, you get diluted gradually. But at the, generally, at the end of the day, the goal is for entrepreneurs to own about 20% of their company, give or take, right? at the point of exit. So you own about 20-ish percent. And if you look at some of the numbers that have come up for some of the later stage companies that have been somewhat successful, it tends to be directionally somewhere in that number, where, whereby it's a, it's, a, it's a really good outcome for the entrepreneur as well. Right? And modeling this kind of dilution thing is quite complicated. I wouldn't try doing Excel. Try and use the tool and you can see if you model things um, as you, the idea is that you want to keep raising uh, larger amounts at higher valuation over time. So it's a, it's the concept is capital staging. Don't think about your fundraise as uh, just this round, just this one, and just maximize and optimize on just this one because there are going to be future rounds down the road. So keep, keep those in mind. 
uh, as you think about and go about your fundraising. Does anyone have any questions? Anybody? Yes. And um, we, we need to get a microphone because uh, I think we're streaming this. For the time being, you can repeat this question. Oh, OK. Uh, oh, sure. Sorry. Hello. Where was the question? Um, when you say 20% for, found, for founder, that's for all of the initial founders. At the end of the rounds, <laughs> all, across all founders, is 20% that remains on average. Yeah, that's correct. That's at the point of exit. That's right. Does anyone have any other questions about this? No? Nope. Anyone? OK. All right. So again, this is, a, this is a very simple example. So let's say you've decided that you need to raise a million dollars. So you've kind of done all the math. You've kind of done the planning on the financials. And let's say you've decided that you're going to sell 25% of your company, right? So then after, the, after, after you sell a quarter of your company, the investors own that pink slice, the, I mean the, the blue slice. So how much is the value of the entire pie after fundraising? It's not a difficult question. Five million. Five million. <coughs> Four million. So because it's, it's you, the investors own one, own a million dollars. Um, I'm sorry, the investors own 25% after the investments. So if 25% is a million, the entire thing is 4 million. Does everyone? Everyone get that? Yes? No, before you said that uh, if, you, if you sold 20% of your company, mm -hmm. raised a million, the pre-valuation was 4 million. Okay. So, um, so your question was um, about the earlier example I gave. No, if the pre-money is 4 million and you invest 1 million on top of it, the post-money valuation is 5 million. Okay. Right. When investors ask about the valuation of your company, they're usually asking about the pre-money valuation of your company. Okay. So, I'm sorry? So this is post. Yes, this is, this is post money. And the pre-money is just the post money minus the amount that was invested, which is three million in this case. Does everyone understand this? I'm sorry if I was, if I was confusing earlier. I thought you just said it was, pre-money was four and the post was five, but your slide says it's pre-money is four. Uh, I was referring to his example just now. Just yeah. People are getting confused with 20%, 25%. Mm -hmm. No, this wouldn't be this wouldn't be thirty three percent. No. So a million on a on a uh, pre money valuation of three, right? Yes. So that would be like 33%, right? No, it'll be the, because the total the total valuation at the end is four million, okay. right? Okay. okay. So let, let let's go through this. So at the, after you invest, the investors own 25% of the company. So a million dollars represents 25% of the company. The entire company, hence, is worth four million. And the, the investment before um, the investor's money comes in is, uh, is worth three million. It's worth three million. So the pre-money valuation in this case is three million. Does everyone understand this? Okay, cool. So this, this is, a, uh, I think, a, a really easy way to kind of be able to back into <coughs> It's an easy way to, to, to be able to back into a number that uh, defines the valuation of your company. And now we can kind of do a range, right? So let's say you're doing a million dollars, you're raising a million dollars, and you're selling, um, and that's a typical range, 15 to 35%. And we do the same math across. So in some cases, you sell more of your company. In some cases, you sell less. <coughs> and you see it comes up to a pre-money valuation somewhere in the range of two to six million. Okay, so this is kind of, and this is actually not too different from the typical pre-money that you get in the Seattle, at least in the Seattle market. Uh, vast majority of companies that are raising for the first time is a seed stage thing. It's a million dollars they are raising, give or take seven fifty to one point five. A lot of them tend to be priced somewhere in the four to six million dollar range. Okay, so anyone have any questions about this? So um, sometimes we have. Okay, so l l let, me just, let me just talk briefly about situations whereby when the valuations are kind of a little bit off base. Uh, when you approach investors, you generally want people to get excited about your company and your vision and yourself and so forth and not really get all stuffed, stumped up about the numbers. So if you're, if you're generally in the range for where you are, you're selling about 20% of your company, your valuation somewhere between two to six, give or take, it's not likely that this is going to become a big conversation. 
if your situations, if you go out to the market, so there are, there are two there are two possible situations. One is that you are absolutely sure your company is worth twenty five million or fifty million or something that's just way out there, right? If, if you come to market on something like that, what what tends to happen, at least in Seattle, is m most investors tend to be very polite. Th this is a nice town, so people are not going to tell you that you got a crazy price tag on your on your on your company. They they're going to tell you, well, you know, I, I think you need to get a bit more traction, you know, and you fill out the team or c come up with some. Other, some, some other polite excuse and walk away. So if, if you table something that's clearly out of whack, well, what's going to happen is that people are not going to engage and you're going to wonder why, right? <coughs> because for me, as the investor, if, if it's clear that the entrepreneur has unrealistic expectations, right? I don't really want to go in and be the bad guy and negotiate a lower number. Right? It, it just, just may not be good my reputation. People may say that, you know, I'm kind of hard on entrepreneurs and tough and so forth. So why, why bother? Just walk away and go do something else. So this is the danger of going just way out. You may, you may just find out that a lot of people are not engaging and you may have a lot of trouble putting the round together. And even if you are successful, right, at raising at a very high valuation. Sometimes some people are. Maybe you're very charismatic. Maybe you found some particularly innocent investors. Uh, maybe you, inv you raise money from outside Seattle because valuations are much higher in other geographies. Valuations vary a lot depending on which geography you happen to be. For people who are actually in Spokane, uh, maybe listening to this on video, the valuations in Spokane, I'm sorry, are actually in fact somewhat lower than, than what they are in Seattle. And the, that, the geographic variability is, is usually a function of um, the balance between um, the availability of capital, how much money is there, and how many like, decent companies are there that are actually backable. And in markets like Seattle, it's actually somewhat in a happy balance. But in certain places, especially in New York and um, many parts of uh, the Bay Area, what you have is situations whereby there is just a, a huge tidal wave of money and not that many really, well, I mean, th there's a lot of companies, but the, there's just way more money than good companies. So prices there are just completely out of whack. Right? But in any case, even if you are successful, let's say you raise at um, $10 million pre-money or $50 million pre-money, and you think you won, right? Um, it, it can come back, it can be sort of a short-term pirate victory. Because what happens is, <coughs> eventually you're going to raise your next round. And if you show up at your next round and you tell your next round investors, hey, you know, my, my last round closed at $15 million post money or something, they're going to be like, what? And, uh, it, and it may be a situation whereby uh, your numbers, the operating numbers that you have achieved, revenue and traction and so forth, do not uh, in any way bring the company close to be able to uh, qualify for a number like that. So what the later stage investor would do is to suggest what's called a down round, right? which means that they will come in, they will invest by a lower valuation from your previous round. Right? Um, those are obviously bad for the investors who participate in the first round, but they tend to be really bad for the entrepreneurs. Because in many cases, if you, especially if you still prefer stock in your first round, there's things called anti-dilution. Uh, protection that the investors get. And, and basically, you're, you're going to have to give up a lot of your shares. I'm not going to go into the details of math. This is not a term sheet uh, workshop. But uh, it, can, it, can get, it can get very, very nasty for, for the entrepreneur. And you're now facing the situation whereby you either take the money and lose a lot of your company and keep getting to build it, or you don't take the money and you, uh, the company goes away. Right? And that, that can be a very, very nasty situation to be in. So th things to think about. Um, try, even if you even if you succeed on the very high end of the valuation stream, it can come back to bite you later on. Um, then there is the issues on the other side of the spectrum. This is situations where I go to Portland, and then I find a, a, so an entrepreneur has sold you know, uh, uh, companies at a 500K, they have raised a million dollars at a $500,000 valuation. You know, st stuff like that, which is kind of really strange, but, but you, you see that kind of thing happening. So now again, it's not usually because of, you know, capricious investors you know, or, or anything like that. It's usually because it's, you're dealing with folks who know very little about startups. Often the investors, their specialty is in real estate and they, they've been using very different metrics for, for valuing the company. So, so you get strange things like that. And, and the problem with doing things of that nature is that once you come out to like sum up professional investors and they look at your cap table, meaning who owns the company, they mean that this thing's broken, right? So to be able to put more money in, I'm going to have to recapitalize, we're going to have to change, we're going to have to give the entrepreneurs, give them more of the company for this thing to work. 
right? And for the only way that can work is for the existing investors in the round to essentially give up shares. They need to dilute down. And that can be a very tense conversation <laughs> between the next stage of investors and the previous stage of investors and potentially involving the entrepreneur stuck in the middle, right, who's trying to get money to fund the company. And these kinds of situations are rarely a pleasant experience on the investor side. And again, it's going to be, well, it, it's such a difficult deal to do, let's go do another one, <laughs> right? So some, if, you, if you make that other mistake of like giving away too much of a company too early and uh, having too, too not enough shares, you may find it impossible, just impossible just to raise another round unless your early investors choose to essentially get, get a soaking from, from the next stage. So th those, are, those are things that are suboptimal situations that can arise if you are outside the ballpark. Uh, what many entrepreneurs then want to know is that, so let's say I'm inside the ballpark, uh, there's still a big difference between two and six. Well, obviously, you know, entrepreneurs, I, I want to have the six million one and not, not, not the two million one. The six million one is definitely the one for me. And so what, what is it that tends to move the needle uh, along this? Um, the sim there, there are a number of factors. Probably the, uh, a sim the, the, sim the most quantitative one is um, how much traction do you have? Generally, I if the company is shipping product, has lots of paying customers, and you, and you are doing a decent amount of revenue for the kind of company you, are, you have, then you, are probably, you can probably argue for something closer to a six. Right? If it's an idea stage company, all you have is a PowerPoint or a keynote, that's it, then you're probably going to be closer to the two. So, so one thing to think about is that uh, when people often ask me, so when should you start fundraising, right? Uh, well, you can always start talking to entrepreneurs early on. I'm um, sorry, talking to investors early on. That's perfectly fine. Right? But um, in terms of actually putting the money in, you mo most entrepreneurs will try and bootstrap the company as long as possible before bringing, the, before bringing investors in because then you get the best possible terms. Um, there, there can be exceptions to that. If you're working in a, in a domain that's moving really fast, right now that tends to be things like um, machine learning, blockchain, the, the hot fashions. Uh, of, the, of the year, then you generally want to be faster in raising because you have competitors who are raising large sums and if they raise before you and they hire all the good people and they suck up all the oxygen in the space, it's going to be really hard for you, right? So th in those cases, you really do need to move fast, you need to raise fast. But otherwise, if you're making, I don't know, mapping software for the oil and gas industry, that, that, that kind of thing, where it really doesn't matter, you know, what, uh, I mean, you don't want to be too leisurely about it, but it doesn't really matter whether you raise now or six months later. Um, put some of your own time in, try and push it forward as far as possible. You'll make your fundraising easy and can generally get better terms. Another thing that tends to move things to, the higher, um, to, to a higher valuation is the quote-unquote quality of the team. This is not something you can generally change. This would be, if you're an entrepreneur who has sold your last company before and, uh, and you made a lot of money for investors and, and, and yourself, then you can raise uh, pretty much uh, anything you want with a cat video or whatever, because that, that's a highly desirable uh, uh, achievement that you have from the past. And sometimes, uh, generally prior startup experience and having really strong domain expertise, those are some of the things that can help on the team side. But team tends to be a, a very more squishy, subjective thing. Different investors have different evaluations uh, of what makes, a, what makes a great team. And more, more concretely, it's not something you can really change uh, yourselves. But those are some of the things that impact where in the range you tend to end up. Does anyone have any questions? Any thoughts? Nothing? Okay, so let me move on. So the early on was one, one example, one way of doing it. Here's a second way of thinking about how you can come out evaluation. And this is the comparables method. So if you have been in the local real estate market recently, a rather, rather hot space, uh, you, you may find that uh, a very common way to value your home is to go look for other homes that have a similar number of bedrooms and bathrooms and so forth, so in roughly the same time. So it's comparables, look at things that are similar. And there are, there are various resources that you can go online and look for. There's something called the Halo Report. Um, this is free, you can download it. The data for the Halo Report comes from um, primarily angel groups around the country. And so it tends to be, so again, you will see again, there's a lot of variation depending on the region that it comes from. Um, there's also another, um, and actually this is, the, this is the example for the Halo Report. And this is just a pre-money valuation. This is the meta number right, across all 
um, all regions and all industries. Again, you can take a look at the report and they give you details and breakdowns into you know, the, the specific domain, the specific um, kind of uh, uh, region that you happen to be operating in. And it doesn't tend to vary by very much. As I mentioned earlier on, it's a very common valuation range. It tends to be somewhere in the two to six. And over the last few years, at least nationwide, it, it's kind of, they kind of hit roughly somewhere in the midpoint on a national basis. And uh, there is AngelList. I'm sure, does everyone not know where, so it's angel.co. Um, one thing about AngelList is that you can slash Seattle or you can slash other things, artificial intelligence, Liza, what, whatever. And they actually have this, this, this number that shows up here. I do not know how they calculate it. I have no clue how it comes through. But again, I, I've noticed that it, it, it tends to be um, somewhere w within the ballpark of, of where you expect things to land. And again, with AngelList, you can drill down to the particular uh, domain and the particular region that you operate in. And, oh, the, and the other resource that I mentioned, PitchBook, uh, this is actually an A of A portfolio company that was their nice exit last year. It was a very profitable one. Well, but that aside, um, PitchBook has fantastic data. You have to pay for it though, it's not free. Uh, if you have friends who can borrow or lend a password to you, that could be helpful if you're a kind of broke startup entrepreneur. Uh, if your friends in Microsoft, they all, all investment bankers will often have uh, subscriptions to that. But that's really the gold standard. You can really go in and be very, very granular about um, what, what um, other companies had uh, raised rounds at. So this is another good way to kind of like um, benchmark where uh, your valuation number would, right, would land at. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. And let, let's wait for the microphone so the folks in school can, can hear you. Okay. You met? Yeah, oh, is it on? Hello? Okay. Okay, go. Cool. So you mentioned with PitchBook, AngelList, mm -hmm. and these different programs, you're able to identify the differences in region for valuation. Did you mention that you can identify the industry specific? Uh, say if someone might be working in a tech startup versus someone working in a predominantly service-based or entertainment uh, startup. Are you able to separate what angel groups uh, prefer to invest in or uh, what the typical valuation is for people in specific industries? Uh, you, you can get to the level of granularity, I think, in AngelList and in PitchBook. I'm not sure about the Halo report. Okay. Um, yeah. But again, you, you are right that uh, the valuations tend to vary tremendously between regions. And the, the other is that uh, sectors, it, it varies between sectors. So one thought about sectors. Remember, if, if you think about the basic idea of how the valuations come about, right? Um, you will notice that the, uh, a very big factor of this, right, of, of what the valuation is, is actually how much you need to raise. Just think about it, right? And I mean, you, can, you can vary, you can sell 20% of your company, you can sell 35% of your company, you move it by a little, right? But fundamentally, it's how much you need to raise. So the reason why, again, sector tends to vary is because certain kinds of companies are more capital intensive. So the life science companies often tend to have higher valuation. And then you may say, if you're telling, it's not fair, how come my, my, these guys many medical device companies, same stage, but how come their valuation is higher? Um, the, the, the simple reason is they, they often need to raise two or three, and they still sell about 20% of their company. Company. So hence, for it to work, otherwise, again, there's a problem of the investor-entrepreneur alignment going on. I'm sorry, you had a follow-on question. No, and I was going to say yeah. that sounds like that lines up with making mm. sure we have that 18-month runway that you previously spoke about. Yeah. That's okay. Yep. Thank you That's so much. Right. That's right. Um, yes, question right here. I. I was wondering if uh, the particular market or the growth rate of the market that you're trying to enter has any influence on moving the needle. The short answer is yes, yes. If you're in a market that's growing very fast, or at least perceived by investors to be growing very fast, or at least right now, I, I mentioned that the, 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 every year there tends to be a, a, a fashion or a hot thing, and right now it's blockchain. Last year it was um, artificial intelligence broadly defined. The year before was virtual reality. It changes every year, right? So, so if, if you happen to be in the place where the sun is shining, yes, you, you, you tend to be able, at, at least to be, to be able to dictate better terms. I'm not sure necessarily if there's, you get a, a bump in valuation, but you suddenly get a lot more interest you're much more likely right now to be able to get a meeting. I mean, right, right now, seriously, I get 
all the companies claim to have some blockchain thing inside there. I mean, why are you using blockchain? Uh, there, there often is a very good answer to why, right? <laughs> but, but you know, I, I'm doing blockchain. It's, it's healthcare records, but it's blockchain healthcare records. No? And last year it was just AI and everything or something like that. And then a bit of that, I think, I guess, is being able to kind of market your fundraise in that sense. But I would say um, if you are like going after a market that's clearly not growing, right? Uh, then, then, it, then it would certainly not, not have a buoyant impact or on the valuation that you're asking, right? If you're selling that really old school software into a really old school vertical, and it's, it's more about taking market share, you've got incrementally better product, then it, it's going to be harder to get people to get excited, and you're going to have less leverage over terms in general. Okay? Does anyone else have any questions? Um, gentlemen here? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. How uh, that fashion is uh, important, like you talk about, you know, AI in 2017 yeah. or the blockchain right now, mm. because in one aspect, yeah. you guys have thousands of deals, everybody talk about the blockchain, yeah. but at the same time, if you have a valid idea in uh. 2018 or 2019, talk about AI, yeah. is it too late? So, um, how should I put it? Uh, uh, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would kind of be, uh, I'll give a very tactical answer uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to you. Is, um, ge generally, if you are out fundraising, mm -hmm. right, you, you want to package your company as attractively as possible. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, using the right buzzwords to the extent they are valid and applicable would be, uh, would, would, would be beneficial to you. Okay, um, I would say right now, if, if, you, if you go out fundraising right now, especially if you're a virtual reality company, I'm sorry if you happen to be in the audience, right? If you're a VR company, you say you're a VR company out fundraising, it's actually going to be really tough writing for you because it, you're just currently not in fashion at this time. It, 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 just, it just is. And, and it, will, it will in fact be challenging in situations like that. But I've noticed that there, there, are, there, are, there are some companies that have been watching or we have invested in for many years and they are ca ca they're, they're like chameleons, right? So when, when big data was, was the thing, they're all big data companies, then they're AI companies. Then there's somehow, a, virtual reality is a bit difficult to squeeze into, but you can be an AI company, right? So, so you kind of evolve the story. Like if you're out there pitching, just think about it, right? If, if, you, can, if you can say the right things and get people excited to engage, that, that I think will be something that would be helpful to you. But underlying all the kind of the razzle dazzle, there does need to be a decent business in there somewhere. And maybe that's where you're coming from in terms of the idea. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh. Uh, so, 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 so far, the how much money we want to raise is sounds like purely based on how much money we need as a uh, founder or startup. -er. Um, how does that play about we expecting how much revenue we're going to generate by five years and ten years and then we thought my company worth 50 million versus I might only need 10 million dollar now so oh, it's too early so your, your, your question is um, does the future rev how, how do future revenues yeah. factor into the the, the, the current stage, yeah. valuation. Um, how do I answer that in the direct? So, um, first of all, if, if we, we when, you, when you approach investors, most most angel investors and most venture investors, they want to be able, they, they want to invest in companies that can scale fast, grow really quickly. Okay. So, if you have a revenue projection in I don't know five years out from now, twenty twenty three or whatever. Where, whereby you are a 50 or 100 million dollar company, um, that, that actually is table stakes, that's basics, just, just a minimum for an entre for, for a, a angel or a VC to even want to look at your company, right? If your company is going to grow from zero to two to four to six to eight million dollars, kind of like, you know, there's, there's very good numbers for most small businesses, but it's not the kind of thing that gets um, many uh, venture or angel investors excited of. So it's kind of like a sort of basic, it's something that you just really need to have, a, a, very, a, a very large number at the end backed by reasonable assumptions to be able to raise money at all, right? As opposed to necessarily, quote unquote, impact the valuation. Now, um, there, are, there, there are a couple of, uh, well, there is a, for some people, I know there are some students here, so um, 
from a theoretical basis, when we talk about valuation, valuation is about positive value of, of future cash flows, the discounted cash flow method. And maybe that's where you're coming in terms of like uh, uh, of revenue and so forth. Uh, I think that the, the trouble with doing DCF related quantitative models for startups is that you, the, the, you it's so uncertain. <laughs> no one really knows. It's all crystal balling. I mean, there are people who have been in the venture business for 30 years. You, you, no, no one knows what the startup is going to do when it comes out of the hatch. Right? So there's just so much uncertainty out there that any kind of quantitative kind of DCF-like method where you're looking at like concrete numbers or, or other numbers very, very far out and trying to discount them forward, uh, it's just not something that's very likely to be workable in, in, the, in, the, startup, in the startup realm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Does, that you. does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's okay. fine. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, yep, go ahead. Um, I was wondering, how, like, comparing companies that are like a platform company versus a company that's like selling a product directly to a customer, mm -hmm. you know, platforms like a two-sided market where you yep. got to get this thing to start and it might take a lot longer, but mm -hmm. the opportunity is a lot bigger. How does that impact the invest, like the valuation? Uh, so... It will have some impact. So, uh, in general, if the market is in general, if the market is larger, if the market is growing faster, yes, you will have be, you will generally be have more leverage in discussing terms with investors of which valuation is one of the terms, right? So that those those that that's that's generally generally the the case. But I think that's really kind of uh, that that's more of a uh, uh, a, a more a more minute and more granular filter to it. But yeah, it, it will certainly have an, a potential upward impact on valuation. Do you have a follow-up to that? Yeah, I guess, well, the f opposite end of that is the risk is higher because you've got, you know, mm -hmm. you're not just selling a product to a customer, mm -hmm. you've got to get consumers and producers both engaged. Mm -hmm. yep. So I'd say that, you know, maybe it could be valued lower because the risk is even greater. I would say that valuation would just be one factor overall mm -hmm. of the general deals package that you can get. With, and w w with your investors. And I think that that's actually a, a good point where, where I, do, I do want to mention some things. Um, wh when, when you think about, uh, when, when entrepreneurs out fundraising, often, especially if it's your first time, right, it's often the, the belief that the number, is all about the number. You know, I, I want to get the, the, the best possible number for myself and my team. We realize that uh, when, when, you, when you enter into a contract with, with investors, there's a whole bunch of other things that, that come along as well, uh, all the other terms. And what, what some investors would say, you know, is that you, know, you can have any valuation if you want if I can set all the rest of the terms. So, so just, just, just be aware, just, just be sure that you know what else is going on in the terms, you, whatever instrument you choose to sell, or convertible notes, preferred shares, or whatever, whatever it might be that makes sense for you. Uh, make sure that you have your lawyer review and you understand exactly what's actually really going on in there. And I think we, we talked a little bit about this, about situations where you have too high or too low evaluation. And um, let, let, me talk, let me just move on a little and talk a little bit about um, kind of the situation you know, where, whereby uh, you have a kind of a, a, a small disagreement with your investors about where the valuation should be. So okay, this, this is not the situation where you are adamant the company is worth 25 million and you're completely out of the ballpark. Th th this is not going to work in this. These are really situations whereby uh, you think the company is worth six or five, but the investor probably thinks it's, may, they may think it's two or three. So that there's, there's a bit of a gap and you, you want to try and find a way to close that gap. And these, these are generally closable things. You are both in the ballpark, but you're kind of in like the different parts, kind of, kind of the, the different, different ends of it. That makes sense. Right? So in, in this kind of situation, um, what is not helpful is to do the, the kind of like the kindergarten kind of stamping match where, you know, so someone shouts, I want three, or I want five, and you see who shouts loud, more, more loudly. And so th those kinds of things are, are, are very unlikely to result in a, any kind of productive outcome. First of all, you're not likely to reach an agreement. And second, realize that um, the... When you when you make, when you get when you bring investors onto your cap table and you partner with them, these are long term relationships. It's a little bit like getting married. It's actually a little bit worse than getting married because you actually get you can actually get divorced, right? But you 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 cannot fire investors once they are on your cap table. They're going to be there, you know, pretty much for the life of your company going forward. So you, you don't really like just that you won't start a first date or a second date, kind of like having a giant argument or who's going to buy pay for the drinks. That's, that's not going to for foster a successful marriage uh, outcome. You, you, don't, you don't want to start uh, off
soft uh, investor relationship with uh, aggressive, like you know, face-to-face -face discussion about uh, hard nose va uh, around valuation. So um, I'm going to share a couple of um, kind of like uh, frameworks that you can use to try and figure out to, to try and reach an, an, an agreement. So uh, with your investors. So the first method. That I'm going to share something called the venture capital method. Now, I want to be very clear, right? This is not called the venture capital method because venture capitalists use this. It's just called this because the Harvard guy, is a Harvard professor who published this method back in the 60s, happened to call it that in, in, in his paper, right? So th this is again not how VCs actually value their company. I also want to be very clear, this is not how you should be valuing your company either. How you should value is what I talked about earlier on. This is really a way to have a conversation with your investors so that you can kind of try and kind of like uh, narrow down towards a number that makes sense for both of you. And the basic way this thing works is that you kind of look out into the future and you estimate how much can you sell your company for, right? And then you ask your investors, right? How much money do they want to make? This should be a fairly simple thing for most investors to answer, a certain amount of their cash. And then you just divide that end number by the return the investors told you, and then you get to the current uh, estimate of the current valuation. That's conceptually how, how this whole thing works. So then the question is then, you know, how, how do you estimate the terminal value? How do you guess you know, how much can you sell your company for? So um, uh, I mentioned earlier, it's helpful sometimes to have financial, uh, as to, to have some kind of financial uh, estimates or uh, projections. I'm sorry for yourself going out a number of years. So you take a look at say the fifth year, the final year of your business, and you take a look at the profit metrics, say uh, from that final year, and then you multiply it by some uh, valuation metric. In this case, the P ratio that you could get from an investment banking friend based on some recent transactions that happened in a similar industry. This is this is one possible way of doing it. Um, there are many other ways you can calculate a terminal value. This is not a canonical way. Um, some companies could be valued on, it could be a pattern thing, it could be number of users, it can be etc. Right? But um, find a metric and then apply a dollar against it that you and your investor agree upon and that will get to a number that uh, represents the future valuation of the company. I think this, uh, the point of doing this again is to have an engaging relationship, uh, engaging conversation and discussion with, with your investor and learn what's important. I guess something about the metrics important for your business uh, for at, at, the, at the end point when you're thinking of selling the business. So that's how you calculate the terminal value. So this is one particular example. So let's say you sell the company in the fifth year and um, hopefully you're making more than $2 million in profit. At that point, this is just a, a, a number chosen for simple calculations and the PE for the, the price earnings ratio for, for, for transact for M&A transactions at that point is around 10. So you just multiply two by 10, you think you can sell your company for 20 million at that final year. So this is just, again, just one particular example. There are lots of ways you can calculate terminal values, right? So again, just, a, just to repeat this stuff, post money, what, what, you, what you want today, post money valuation, the valuation today, what's the future value, the terminal, estimate a terminal value and divide it by what your investor told you, the amount they wanna make. So th this is just one particular example uh, where if you just go through the working, the terminal value in this case is the profit five into 15, which is 75 million, how much you think the company can be sold for. And the, let's say your investor has told you they want to make 20 times the money, you just divide it by 20, you get into 4 million, or uh, 3.8 in this case. And uh, that's the post money though. So you want to subtract whatever you plan to raise and then you get a pre-money of 2.8. So th this is one again, a, a particular way in which you can arrive at a number. Now does anyone have any questions about this framework? Sir? Uh, this framework assumes profitability after five years. So what if many companies don't have profitability after five years? So the question about, so maybe you're not profitable in year five. As I mentioned earlier on, the terminal value can be calculated in many different ways. So it's about finding an appropriate metric that you think will work for the, maybe your particular, maybe it's a life science company. Many life science companies go public with no revenue, right? Not, not even no profits, right? So it, it's, it's about finding a, a mutually agreeable metric and kind of capitalizing it based on uh, a, a dollar value that is, uh, that, that's relevant for the sector. Okay, any other questions? <coughs> Sir, I mean, maybe you wanna. 
Go ahead. Thank you. Um, where can we find the, the appropriate uh, price to earnings ratio that we can apply? So um, for, to get PE ratios, you, the, the easy way is to just use a, um, well, you had, uh, you figure out your sector, and then you can go into like general purpose tools like Yahoo Finance and Google Finance, and you can find PEs for entire sectors. Uh, if you're not sure how to do that, you can ask an investment banking friend or someone who works in that sector, and uh, they will be able to give you some guidance. I can, I can answer that question in more detail later. If you have more, yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay, so I'm going to share an, a, another way that you can use to think about this. So th this is called the scorecard method. And, and, and the, the basic way to, 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 do, to, to handle this is, first you start with a, a middle point. Kind of, uh, uh, you know, what, 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 what's the av for given your sector and your region and so forth, what's the average pre-money for a company like yours? So that, that's kind of like the, the ground zero. And, and then you basically adjust it. In, in, one way or in, in one way or another, based on a set of mutually agreed on factors. And this is one particular example of ways in which the factors can play out. You can have, um, in this case, uh, team is really important, market sizes too, and there are some other factors that um, have other weights assigned to them. Again, this is not the canonical answer. This is, again, something that you can have a discussion with your investor about what's important to you. Is it the people? You know, is it the market? Is it how far along the product is? Some investors, the team is 95%. You'll be surprised, right? And for, for other people, maybe it's revenue or whatever. So, so come out with a particular set of weightings, right, across factors. Uh, make sure that the weights actually sum to one, right? So you assign something to all of these. And then, for each of the weightings, you kind of have a, um, uh, I guess, a, an adjustment against it. So in this case, for example, you, you may believe that, um, you may both mutually agree, this is a stronger than usual team by 30%, because they've got great domain expertise, for example. But the market isn't so good in this, because it's kind of a niche thing, right? So we kind of handicap the market a little bit. And you, and you kind of go through the same kind of discussion for each of these, and, and then you um, multiply across, Right, so the 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 thirty percent to the one thirty percent gets to the zero point three nine on the end. So you just multiply the whole thing across and you add it up, and that gives you a weighted multiple of the factors, right? And in this case, it says, well, you know, if the average valuation for a company in your region is three, um, but so we think that across all the things we discuss, you, you're, it's probably worth a bump, right? So in this case, maybe a 10% bump. So uh, we, can, we can agree on a 3.2 or a 3.3, right? So the, the, this is a way, again, in which you can have a productive conversation, learn a lot about your investor through this process, and uh, come out to a, a mutually agree, something that you can mutually agree upon. Does anyone have any questions about how this works? Yes? I mean, compared to mm -hmm. this, uh, compared to this method and the previous method, yeah. uh, this seems, I mean, the previous seems to be more volatile. Uh -huh. This, I mean, you can maybe only do like a 30 or 40 percent max with this method. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Like, if there is a big discrepancy between the investor and you, you say two, three versus yeah. five, six, I don't think that using that metrics, I can make like a double. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your okay. thoughts on that between two? So you're right that both of these methods are going to give very, very different numbers, right? And, and again, I, I, the purpose of these things are not to value your company or to come out with a number. The purpose of these things are if you are having a fight with your investor about what the number should be, these are some helpful ways to have a discussion about it. And they may result in different numbers, and that's okay. Then you can talk about why they are different and eventually, essentially guide towards like a, you know, something that's based on facts and third-party data and, and kind of uh, mutual factors that you both agree are important upon to get to a point of agreement. That, that's, the, that's the reason for using these things. The actual number of numerical output is less important. Okay? So it is one o'clock and there is another session after this. So I'm afraid I have to end it right now. Um, if you want the presentation, feel free to send me an email. And uh, if you have any questions for me, you want to chat about your company, the Alliance of Angels, I'm going to be here for a bit. So and uh, I may be outside because I think there's another presentation. So alrighty, I'd um, like to thank, thank Promotion for hosting. Really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for coming today. Thanks so much for coming, and thank you so much for presenting. That's the best explanation of, of evaluation that I've ever heard for a startup company. Um, we do have Sarah Ashmore and... You want to use this? Can oh, you okay. Great. I'll do that. Um, we have Josh... Thank you. Um, Sarah Ashmore and Joshua Chang.
presenting corporate basics after this. So please consider staying, and uh, it's a great presentation. Uh, if you would also like copies of Yi Jing's um, presentation, you can also check the box on where you signed in. And uh, those get sent out, I think, towards the end of the day or possibly oh, tomorrow morning. Oh, so yeah, it's right out to you. Oh. Uh,
Uh, two or three people, yeah. right? And a founder is defined as All someone right, so who has we're a get significant here. Um, I'm Sarah share Ashmore, and this is Josh Chang. On the, on um, and we're from the UW right? Entrepreneur Generally Law Clinic, and we're here to give the, a discussion the, on the, uh, corporate the, basics, the, um, more like choice of entity type matters. Something like that. So if you have, it doesn't matter if you have ten co-founders. If it's that two of you own. 80% of the company the and everyone else owes two and three percent. That's no problem. Okay. Right? But you don't want situations where you're six people and each one say owns Split. fifteen or twenty percent. Okay. You definitely don't want that kind of thing. Generally you want it, it needs to be clear who's in charge. Right. It's helpful if there is a CEO or a lead founder right. okay. who maybe owns fifty one percent or some some large sum, right? It doesn't I, I don't it's not I don't mean the number, yeah. but it has some <laughs> materially larger chunk. And then often there are a few like junior founders and they own a smaller chunk. Absolutely. Right, two or three people. Absolutely. Right. And, so the whole, I mean, in total, two or three Sorry people. Sorry about that. Right, but uh, that, that's kind of how it splits out. So the most important thing is the really not too many people own a lot of the company. Okay. It's about the equity split. No presentation on general advice. It's not any legal okay, advice. Yeah. So if you have any you know, legal questions uh, as you get so farther down in your business, you should go and seek a legal or tax advisor. Yeah, sure. Well, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so how can we you? can discuss the <laughs> most common entity types, uh, but just briefly by show of hands, how many of you guys have incorporated or have business plans ready? Okay, nice. great. So if you guys have business plans or have you know even started you know trying to form a business form any profits, then you guys have already formed an entity. Uh, and that's the most common one when we have a sole proprietorship. And we'll get into all these uh, as we talk about them. So as listed here, sole proprietorship, partnerships are broken down here, uh, corporations, limited liability companies, uh, nonprofits, and uh, LLPs um, as part of the partnership. So. so the first question for those of you that haven't, you know, form an entity at all is, you know, what is the best entity that aligns with your business goals? Um, and so one thing you want to think about is, you know, what types of products and services are you providing? So we have a few examples. Um, you know, if you're going into real estate or you yourself are a sole business owner, you may want to form an LLC um, because, you know, you have, you can protect your personal assets, you know, as well as you have the flexibility of, you know, offsetting your own personal income from uh, the losses of your business, and we'll go into this a little more. Um, another example is, you know, if you have a family-run business, you're doing personal services. You know, y you may want to form an S corporation because it has the advantages of, you know, avoiding certain self-employment taxes. So, a lot of times when you're forming an entity, you're trying to think of the tax advantages of each one. Right. So, as we noted earlier, corporations can be split up into S and C corporations. So that's just a uh, a tax preference, um, but the most common uh, method for forming a C corporation or reason to form a C corporation is uh, when you're dealing with a business that has new technology, um, you know, some, some kind of sophisticated business plan that uh, eventually plans to have a, a national presence. And a lot of this comes along the lines of forming in, uh, in Delaware uh, and specifically having a uh, established uh, set of case law in Delaware that a lot of venture capitalists are uh, familiar with and uh, that'd be something that when you guys are seeking funding for like a larger company that uh, is what VCs are interested in and will want as like a general prerequisite. Um, professional services, so like a, uh, a law firm oftentimes will be formed as an LP or a PLLC. So the P in front of that just is, stands for uh, professional and that will vary from state to state. Certain states don't allow professional LCs. Uh, I believe California is one of them that doesn't allow it. Uh, so that will depend on your, uh, your jurisdiction. And to uh, serve a social good. So you can consider a nonprofit or a social purpose corporation. And uh, we'll go into those again later down the line. But social purpose corporations are corporations themselves. Uh, but the only, the only difference really is uh, writing out in your articles of incorporation about a, social, a specific social purpose that you're interested in, in, uh, in pursuing. And uh, nonprofit is uh, generally what people consider, and it's very broad range, and it's listed in the, uh, uh, the IRC with a list of what can be a, uh, a nonprofit. And things, for example, are like churches and like fraternities, for example. 
Um, another consideration is, you know, where are you conducting business? You know, if you're here in Washington, and you're not planning on, you know, operating, you know, outside of the state, you know, it probably makes sense to just incorporate here in Washington and not, you know, waste your money incorporating somewhere like Delaware or Colorado. But if you want to, you know, go national, maybe, you know, it makes sense to incorporate in a place of Delaware. We keep bringing up Delaware because they actually are very sophisticated with business law. There are a lot of investors that want to invest only in those uh, companies incorporated in Delaware. Um, another consideration, I kind of just got to it, is funding. So if you yourself are just bootstrapping your business, you know, you're not obtaining any other outside capital. You know, you're not, you don't have to cater to anybody else, so just cater to your needs if you want to operate in the state alone. But if you we are seeking VC financing or some other financing and they want to only invest in somebody that's, you know, incorporated in Delaware, then you may want to think about incorporating there. Um, and you also want to think about are you for profit or not for profit? Because if you're, you know, trying to do a nonprofit, you want to take advantage of, of the, you know, the tax, um, the tax advantages. So you're going to want to, you know, if you if your incentive is to do non -for -profit, non for profit work, then like form is that because you have major tax advantages. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're getting to that a little uh, down the line, but that's true. Like, it depends on what type of funding you're receiving. Um, you know, if you're seeking VC financing, those people, investors want preferences, right? They want to have preferences over the founders because they're putting a lot of capital into it. Um, but certain entities, you know, allow, you know, certain entities you can you can't give preferences to certain shareholders. So you're going to want to think about those like implications as well. Yeah, that's what I meant. So, by, by the way, I'm Tyler Long, I'm founding director of Andrew Wall, and we're joined by Venture Capital Work, and I, I help supervise the uh, entrepreneurial law clinic. So, I'm, I'm here to also help answer questions. Yeah, Tyler's a great source for, so get all your questions out for Tyler at the end. <laughs> He's great. Um, but we'll go into more detail of like, you know, the investing aspects of each entity type and whether, you know, it'd be advantageous or not advantageous to find investors for those entities. Um, and then we're going to just start going through the, the common types and Josh, we'll start with the sole proprietorship and the advantages and disadvantages of this entity type. Okay, so uh, the reason why I asked everyone earlier to raise your hand if you started a business or not, um, and again, if you could raise your hand if you have formed a business, um, if I may ask, have you guys formed, uh, have you guys actually done filings? Okay, um, have you done a filing? Perfect. Okay, I think that's a great example because uh, the sole proprietorship is a situation where it's so easy to form, where just basically if you are on your own and you're trying to start a business, you're trying to start any kind of thing, you are eventually, you are essentially already formed, right? So there is no uh, formal filing requirement to form a sole proprietorship. Um, and there's no ongoing maintenance because you've already formed it there uh, and you pay taxes on a personal return. Uh, so. Well, we'll get into it a little further, but there's basically, like when we deal with corporations, there's a, a dual tax structure as opposed to uh, like a sole proprietorship or other kind of partnerships, which are kind of these things called pass-through entities, which uh, the taxes are dealt with on a personal basis. Um, however, the issue with sole proprietorships is there is no limited liability, and limited liability is a topic that we'll be touching on very briefly, and it's not very investor friendly. So. A lot of times you'll hear investors say, like, we're not necessarily investing in the company, we're investing in the entrepreneur. That's true, but with a certain caveat. They want to invest in the entrepreneur, entrepreneur, but they also want to have limited liability. So uh, we can go ahead. So limited liability uh, right here. Uh, it, with partnerships and sole proprietorships, uh, they don't provide limited liability protection. So that means uh, if a creditor is seeking your assets, they can go after your business assets and they can go after your personal assets. And that's something that we don't want to, that, that's something we do not want to happen, uh, especially, and that's the whole point of forming entities and uh, protecting yourself. Um, corporations, LLCs, LLPs uh, are great sources to uh, seek that protection. And a lot of the times with LLCs, you'll see that uh, people are forming solo uh, LLCs to create that kind of protection. Um, 
A big thing with limited liability, though, and to maintain that protection is uh, maintaining things called corporate formalities and uh, and uh, not commingling your assets. So an instance of this is essentially like if you're forming an entity, you want to, uh, you know, even on your own, you might want to uh, have your own bank account. You want to separate your funds because if you're going to be audited in a certain scenario and um, say like the RRS will see that your your bank account is being used personally and for your uh, your own business needs then they'll say like hey what are you doing here this is not really a split of your personal and your uh, business life here and in that instance this uh, term called piercing the corporate veil which will allow creditors to go after your personal assets so that's essentially a waste of actually uh, of forming an entity and you don't want that to happen so uh, we want to maintain corporate formalities, and there's a, a slide on the next page that shows this um, in a visual manner. And uh, on the big circle, the creditors are people that will have any kind of uh, stake in your business. And uh, if something happens to your business, they can go after your business assets, and this corporate veil is protecting you, right? Uh, and with regards to your, uh, your assets, there are certain tiers of, uh, of, say, uh, of status to say that certain creditors can seek uh, your assets before others. So that might be happening when uh, venture capitalists um, you know, sign a deal with you uh, and they might have a preferred stock or there might be uh, debt obligations that have a higher priority in terms of seizing, seizing your assets. So uh, be cognizant of that. And uh, the, the point of maintaining the corporate veil is once those assets have been seized, uh, they can't go after any of your personal livelihood. So they can't go after your car, your house, or anything that you, uh, you've invested on that personal end. And with general partnerships, it's very similar to sole proprietorship. So uh, if you two right here uh, were to discuss, hey, I have this great plan. And he's like, that's a great plan. It's like, I really like the sound of that. And uh, you decide, hey, let's you know, proceed. Like, Give me your phone number, and we're going to go and uh, start this business together. At that point, you've formed a general partnership. And it's as simple as that. And again, it's the same concerns with, uh, with the sole proprietorship, where um, it's not necessarily investor friendly, and there's no limited liability. So you want to protect yourself from that end. And uh, as part of the con say, it can form without realizing it. That happens a lot. And uh, you might have a great relationship uh, at the time now, but you know if some kind of argument stems uh, or grows uh, later on down the line, you don't want to uh, be, be dealing with that. Um, so. so the next uh, entity form is limited liability partnership. And uh, it essentially caters to the downfalls of the general partnership that Josh was talking about. One thing is that uh, you do have limited liability, which is a major advantage. Um, so if Josh and I were partners and we had a third party, um, if you know Josh did something awful, I wouldn't be you know liable for what he, had, he has done, or I wouldn't be liable um, for the partnership's debts or credits, um, um, the creditors. Uh, one advantage is that there's flexibility in management. So when you think about corporations, you know, there are board of directors and there are officers and there are employees and they have specific roles. But here in a partnership, there actually aren't any formalized roles. You could actually have, you know, the two partners, us, two of us, and we could, you know, have equal management rights. Or you could actually, in your partnership agreement, draft like specific provisions like I will do, you know, A, B, C, and Josh will only do, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so you have that flexibility of management styles. Um, there are fewer formation requirements. You do actually have to file um, with the state to form an LLP. Um, and, but it's pretty simple. You know, you, it's a filing fee. You submit a piece of paper and put the company name on it. And there are other formalities. Um, and there's less maintenance requirements compared to corporations. They're not as like, stringent with like, the, the record keeping. Um, the cons is that it's not investor friendly. Um, one reason is because so this is a, it's, it's also a pass-through um, entity, so you would have to, whoever invests would have to have those, you know, that ownership on their personal tax returns, and some investors don't want to muck up their own personal tax returns. Um, it's also difficult for um, allocation of equity, um, and so that's why it's not investor friendly. Uh, and it's, this is not necessarily a con, but it's primarily used by professionals, as Josh was mentioning earlier, that there are a lot of states that don't allow professionals to use LLCs, so this is a, an option for professional um, businesses. 
Uh, next is limited liability company, which is an LLC. I realize we didn't define that for you guys. Uh, but a pro is also the flexibility and management. It's the same concept as an LLP. Um, you actually have the option of choosing how you want to be taxed. And we're actually going to go into that concept of double taxation and pass-through taxation. But you, the fact that you have an option is, is an advantage in this case. Um, you also have limited liability, which is the best thing you can have. Uh, again, there's fewer formation requirements. Again, you have to file with the state to become an LLC. It's not like a general partnership or a sole proprietorship where you just automatically form it. Um, again, there's less uh, requirements for maintenance compared to corporations. And it's actually really easy to change between entities. So for example, here in uh, Washington, if Josh and I formed an LLC and we decide, oh, we have this amazing investor, we want to form the change into a C corporation, all you have to do is file a, a certificate of conversion. It's one form, you pay a filing fee, and you already have a corporation. And all of our membership interest is transferred over in the same like, um, ratio. So if we own 50% of the LLC, file that piece of paper, it gets approved, and now we own 50% each of the corporation. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy. Um, the cons is, again, it's not investor friendly. It's for the same reason it's passed through. Investors don't want to get, get these things on their personal tax returns. It's difficult to allocate equity. And also, there are a lot of investors that, so the, the, the advantage of an LLC is that there's so much flexibility. And actually, and sometimes investors don't want that. It's almost too flexible. Like they want to know, like, they just want to be aware. So they like statutory, statutorily um, formed entities or that, yeah. Uh, it does require a carefully drafted operating agreement. So an operating agreement is a contract amongst the members on how to actually operate the company. And so because there's so much flexibility, you actually have to write this down and draft it and how you want to, you know, I'm going to be responsible for ABC again and then Josh is responsible for X, Y, and Z. So you have to write those things down. Um, and if, if that's something you want to do, we definitely advise that you seek legal counsel for that because it can be a little complicated. Exactly. So flexi flexibility comes with its pros and cons, definitely. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, can an LLC uh, accept a convertible note investment from like an angel? Or yes. Or does that drive the legislation you need to be a C corp? Well, it, it can accept a convertible note, but that convertible note um, would convert into membership units rather than stock. And so, it, so there's the complicated answer in that baseline form of convertible note that everybody uses and is familiar with is written for a corporation so you have to modify it so that would go from something that's formulaic and easy and understood and to think off the shelf to something that's now hybridized and modified and it's not impossible but it's you know. it's a question of which path is easier to just become a C corp or exactly to do all the take out the flexibility so that everybody knows what they're getting away with it, exactly yep. the, the other point that, that I was alluding to earlier about
it's more complicated. Uh, just adding on really quick with the uh, LLCs, uh, a cool thing also is just if you are, you can do single member LLCs and these are considered disregarded entities um, for tax purposes. Uh, but with, uh, with note is uh, a single person LLC doesn't necessarily need an operating agreement. So if there's any kind of uh, apprehension for, you know, uh, seeking limited liability, but you're concerned about legal fees early on, you can be a single member LLC without needing a operating agreement. Uh, so getting to C corporations, um, as we mentioned uh, ad nauseum, it's very attractive to investors uh, just because of the established case law, the established uh, the statutory um, uh, basis for it, uh, and it's, uh, in particular in uh, in Delaware, and that's where uh, a lot of the recommendations go for if you're forming a, a C corporation that plans to uh, have like a national presence and seek uh, venture capital financing from a wide range of, uh, of sources. Uh, you still have the limited liability and uh, the predictability of corporate law is just based off of uh, the judges in, in Delaware having a very uh, high familiarity with this topic and um, going through the, the, uh, the amounts of litigation and uh, having that predictability for uh, these, uh, these investors to know what's gonna happen in scenario X, what's gonna happen in scenario Y. Um, the cons with this, uh, additional formation requirements. So if you're gonna be, uh, a question that you guys might be thinking of is if you're forming in Delaware, like can I do business in Washington? Can I do business in California? Like, yes, you can. Uh, but there are additional burdens and there are additional taxes on top of that. So in this situation, you are a Delaware corporation and if you're working in Washington, you're kind of, you're like a foreign corporation in Washington. So you have additional taxes that you need to pay in Washington and in Delaware. So those are ongoing. Um, as noted, it requires more maintenance. Um, so you have to be cognizant of all this. Uh, there are annual filing requirements. Um, if you're in a C corporation, you're probably planning, it's a C corporation is also very conducive to becoming a public company down the line. Uh, and that goes more along the lines with bigger companies. And if that does occur, then you'll have additional um, filing requirements as well. With the SEC, you'll be filing annual requirements, uh, disclosure, obliga uh, disclosure obligations, uh, which can be very burdensome for, for companies. So uh, that is something that uh, needs to be considered in the spectrum of uh, C corporations, and that's why they are generally considered a lot more work. Um, but as Tyler noted earlier, there is uh, the flexibility to allow for different classes of stock. Uh, you can do preferred stock, common stock. You can do different series of preferred stock. So you can have like a, an elevated preferred stock. Um, uh, that's superior to another preferred stock level. And that can come through different levels of financing uh, during your multiple rounds. And again, with the uh, C corporations, there are, uh, it's, this is a structure with double taxation. So uh, this is gonna depend on the changing tax rates and, and whatnot. But the, uh, the double taxation refers to the first taxation being at the, the corporate level. So whatever revenue that the, the, the corporation generates. And then the second uh, taxation is uh, in the form of a distribution to your shareholders as a dividend. So there's, uh, again, the corporate tax, and then there is the uh, dividend tax. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go for it. Go for it. something that 
is that you anticipate investing the profits back into the business to grow the business, a high growth business where the monetization for the owners is a sale event or an IPO, that if you go up to crazy fine, you have a list of other taxation that isn't terribly relevant. But if you're doing something where the, the purpose of the venture is to draw out annual income for the shareholders, then the double taxation potential is appropriately vast. So that's why earlier when Sarah was talking about what your corporate principles are, what type of entity you're doing, if it's a real estate investment vehicle, obviously the goal there is to draw annual income. So we all just set up this LLC or some other type of pass-through entity. Um, or you know, service businesses, restaurants, those sorts of things are all LLCs, usually pass-through entity LLCs versus technology companies, you know, the typical venture back company investing back into growth for the company so the double taxation doesn't matter. And you know, so, so that's the double the, the pass through versus double taxation is is really critical and kind of the first first order question that I think drives you to the strategy question. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, we have an image here of just kind of going over the double taxation and the pass through taxation. Um, I think it'll help clarify some things, but uh and just as an example, say Josh and I are operating as a C corporation and we generate, our corporation generates $10,000 and it's in the corporation. So the corporation itself has to pay taxes on the $10,000. So that's the first level of tax in a double, um, double structure. And then if you know, we decide, oh, we wanna distribute $1,000 each from that 10,000, then the $1,000, we individually have to pay taxes on that, on that distribution. So those are the two levels of tax. And for pass-through entities, which are LLCs, C corporations, and partnerships, um, again, if you know we're operating as an S corporation and we generate ten thousand uh, dollars of income, uh, you know it's it's technically in the corporation, um, but it actually gets passed through to us. You know, regardless of whether you know we decide the S corporation to make a distribution to us, we actually have to pay tax on that. So if we own fifty percent of the company, um, we generate ten thousand dollars in income. We have to pay taxes on the five thousand dollars each. Um, regardless of whether the corporation, you know, decides to give a distribution to us or not. Um, does that make sense? So the pass-through means it has to pre-exist and pay back the taxes. Correct. The Correct. That's exactly it. But here, it actually has to make a stop at the corporation. You have to pay taxes. And then as it goes down, you have to pay again. Again, on a personal level. Yeah, of course. That's a good. That's a good question. Actually, for that's actually the advantage of an S corporation. Um, for an S, or let's go back. Ooh. That's actually the advantage of an S corporation is that you have the pass through taxation, um, but you actually can. So, if you're an employee of an S corporation and um, you actually have a salary, you'd have to pay self employment taxes on that. But you can actually structure it in a way that you're saying, you know, I'm going to give myself, you know, a reasonable distribution. So it's classified as a distribution, and you don't actually have to pay self employment taxes on that. So that's the advantage of an S corporation. Uh, one of the major advantages. Um, and just going down, yep. of, of course. Oh, okay. So I think to answer your question in the, in the C corp context, you would, so salaries are an expense against revenue. So they'll, they'll drop down the corporate income that gets taxed at that level. And then your salary would get taxed only at your individual level. So theoretically, I think to your point, you could wipe out all of the corporate profits by paying yourself a massive salary and then um, wipe out any corporate level tax and have it all be at individual level tax. But the issue with the corporation, like the countervailing point to that is you're probably gonna have investors and they're not gonna, they're not gonna allow that level of salary. So they're gonna want some fixed level of salary and the monetization comes on a liquidity event and you can't, the IRS will look through if you tried to like jump up and pay yourself a $10 million salary uh, in the year of an exit. And so they, they'd look through that. So you, you, you could game the system if you had a C Corp with no outside investors, but if you have that, then you might as well form an LLC and then it's all passed through and it doesn't really matter anyways. Um, uh, back to S corps. Uh, so the cons about an S corporation. So S corporation, by the way, it's it's just a tax election. They're all corporations. Just they decide to file as an S corporation for tax purposes. Um, so one of the cons is that there's an additional formation requirement. So when you incorporate a corporation, you're automatically or by default you're a C corporation. You're subject to the double taxation. But you actually, for an S corporation, you have to go with, to the IRS and you actually have to file a form and elect S corporation status. 
Um, it requires more maintenance because there are actual specific requirements to uphold an S corporation. So first, you can only have certain types of shareholders. You can have you can have foreign investors. You have to have individuals, not companies, investing um, in your company. As well as you know, you can have certain trusts. It's very there are a lot of different like details on that. Um, uh, the one big thing is that you can only have one class of stock. So usually it's going to be it's going to be common stock, and so it's not really friendly to investors because again, an investor is going to want certain preferences via preferred stock, whether you know they have veto rights on certain things or you know they're first in line to invest in the next round of uh, funding. So for S corporations, investors aren't going to get that; they're just going to get one class of stock, and so a lot of investors are not keen on that. Um, and you can also have no more than 100 shareholders, so you have to uphold all of those things, and so it's really easy to actually lose S corporation status. But if that's the case, you actually just revert back to a C corporation or subject to double taxation. Yeah, like like Sarah mentioned really quick uh, with the, the S corporation, the uh, the cool thing that Tyler mentioned earlier is how like in a C corporation you can have an LLC uh, investing within that C corporation, whereas like the S corporation you cannot do that. Uh, so that's what she means like by the individuals versus like an entity type. Um, so for social purpose corporations, uh, the pro is if a corporation is like for profit, but they have altruistic goals. Uh, in your art articles of incorporation, you can focus on uh, saying that you have a social purpose, uh, and it could be something like uh, focusing on the environment. It could be saying focus like we, we care about our employees, and this speaks more to uh, this aspect of fiduciary duties uh, with within the board itself, where uh, board members are required uh, by they have a fiduciary duty to like maximize profits for the corporation. Uh, and clearly, if there's a social purpose, that kind of is a countervailing uh, uh, belief. Uh, so as silly as that sounds, certain people have to, or excuse me, certain uh, people have to uh, file as a social purpose corporation if they believe in, uh, in wanting to uh, pursue this social purpose. And a, uh, I have an example, but uh, go for it. No. Yeah, so a B corporation, so this is an actual entity type, um, like with Washington, but a B corporation corporation is actually operated by a, a another company and it's just a certification process. Um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, an example of where a social purpose corporation might have been good, um, and this is like back in the early 1900s uh, with Ford Motor Company. Uh, so Ford Motor Company, uh, one of the biggest manufacturers of cars at that time, and uh, they had uh, an idea that they wanted to pay their employees more. So they pursued that, but uh, shareholders uh, filed a suit against them because they felt like they weren't maximizing profits and the shareholders won in that situation. So uh, that's the purpose of a social purpose corporation in that situation where you're like, if you're focused on like something, some altruistic idea that you uh, don't necessarily have to maximize your profits in the situation and you can pursue the social goal. Um, so uh, the, the cons are, sorry, did a question? So that, that's all true, but I think your question was related to a trust. So 
trust would be a uh, pass-through entity. Uh, so the, the social purpose corporation is still subject to the double tax. It's just, to your point, it's an alleviation of this responsibility to only maximize profits. And just to clarify one thing, I don't think you, I, I think the case law and the, and the statutory interpretation is that you can pursue both purposes. I don't think one is greater than the other. So I'm not quite sure you could put yourself out of business pursuing the, pursuing the one goal, but you can't, it's some protection from a fiduciary duty perspective that, to, to his example, if you throw a little bit of money towards your social purpose, you're not exposing yourself to shareholder claims. Um, interesting side note, uh, Professor Fan, I know, is writing a little bit about this, but uh, venture capital investors and other investors have become more and more comfortable over the last uh, several years investing in social purpose corporations and B Corps um, under the theory, because they're obviously just trying to maximize profits, not necessarily, they're not, they're not organized for the social purpose, but under the theory that the social purpose has itself a marketing benefit, particularly in consumer facing companies that might ultimately maximize profits. So that, you know, that used to be a concern five years ago. It's not really anymore, or it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a dispositive concern. Uh, I believe so, because a social purpose corporation, at the end of the day, is still a corporation. So uh, for tax elections, you can still choose to be a C corporation or an S corporation. Uh, it's just the only main difference is just this social purpose aspect that you, uh, that you include in your articles. Um, so aside from that, like pretty much everything else with regards to taxation is a similar, similar aspect. Uh, and uh, there is additional required uh, public disclosure about social purpose, and uh, I believe you need to put your social purpose on your primary website. And um, you have to actually file your, your uh, annual reports on your uh, primary website. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so we've gone through this already, but. Okay, uh, and nonprofit organizations, uh, so this is a great uh, vehicle to pursue if you want to pursue a social purpose, but you don't want to be hampered by any kind of uh, duty to maximize profits or anything like that. Uh, so you can obtain a federal tax exemption status uh, and state, uh, federal state tax exemption status. And at the federal level, I believe you file a, a Form 1023. Is that okay? Uh, so. Uh, you filed that, and uh, in the uh, Internal Revenue Code uh, listed in 501c3, uh, there is a wide list of, uh, of things that can be deemed a, uh, a nonprofit organization. So churches are a very common example. Uh, as part of that, uh, there are limitations as well with regards to things like, uh, like lobbying. I I think 501H spells out like the limited lobbying aspects of it, uh, but an, a very important and relevant aspect of this is uh, these nonprofits can't uh, endorse political candidates. And uh, as you guys might have been following with the uh, recent uh, tax plan that was proposed. Right, the C3s is what I'm talking about right here. Uh, so the C3s, uh, can't endorse political candidates, and there was, and that's, that's known as the uh, the Johnson Amendment, and the Republican tax plan proposed to remove this, um, which would effectively allow churches to endorse candidates and uh, say, like, hey, let's, um, people of the Catholic demographic, like, let's vote for this, uh, this candidate, and we endorse them publicly. Uh, but the final tax plan uh, did not remove the Johnson Amendment, uh, but it is something that is a uh, hot topic of discussion, and that might pop up again later down the line. Uh, as far as the 501c4, uh, these are known as social welfare organizations, and again, they can get uh, federal tax exemption. Um, they are situations where, if as noted, uh, you don't necessarily need to pursue uh, like a maximization of profits or anything like that. And uh, these nonprofit organizations per have the uh, limited liability protection. Um, the limited purpose speaks to uh, what you're forming your, uh, your entity type as, like you uh, are limited within that spectrum of what that uh, the entity is doing uh, and what that, uh, that business is doing. So. Um, like a church, like the church is 
like a church, you have your demographic, you do like Sunday schools, you do uh, mass, but you don't go out and like develop the next Tesla or anything like that. So uh, as, as noted, it's, there, it's limited in that aspect. Uh, and the additional form formation requirements with additional filings and whatnot. Uh, and yeah. The additional ongoing maintenance, I think, is really important. So there's significant annual filing obligations. There's restrictions on salaries. There's processes you have to go through before you set salaries. All kinds of things. All kinds of things that the IRS can look into that are much more limiting than in a you know for-profit corporation where the fiduciary duties are the things that limit it. So that's a you you have to think long and hard before you're going to be a 501c3. And there's a lot of requirements and a, and a lot of hoops you have to jump through. So I, I wouldn't minimize the ongoing requirements. So that was the uh, our general overview of the most common entity types. But I just want to, I probably should have done this earlier, but we're part of the entrepreneurial law clinic, so we're law students. And there's a, a program there that we actually take on clients, um, like startup companies, and we actually give them legal advice on things like this. Um, you know, if you guys, you know, based on, you know, we'd have a meeting and based on the facts of, you know, your, your situation, we would actually write, you know, an audit memo saying, like, you should form a C corporation for these specific reasons. And we also have... Uh, uh, we also have IP students as well, so if you you know you have a company and you're like, oh, well, I'm you know I don't know if I can patent this specific thing or I want to copyright, like how do I do that? Um, we actually have a, a free service at the law school that you can be a part of, and you can actually um, email that number there, send an email there, or, or give us a call, or if you have any questions about that that service, you can always come up and ask us about it as well. Um, but if you guys have questions. There's equity holder concepts, so you're either a shareholder or an option holder or something. That's fine to hold equity in multiple different entities. There's employment concepts as well. And so depending, now there's going to be employment paperwork or advisor paperwork or something for all of those entities, and that might have some prohibitions against what else you're doing. Um, but from a corporate legal perspective, being an owner or an equity owner of some type of equity in multiple different entities of different types isn't a problem. I think the question that you're asking is getting at do you have any restrictions in your employment or advisor documentation with either of those companies that would prohibit you from working for the other one? Kind of moonlighting, you might have heard that concept before. Anti-moonlighting provisions. Well, from, from a personal... Sure. I think the question is really just getting at the heart of can you be splitting your time between two startups that are different entity types and does that affect any of the issues that were just talked about? Um, no, you, you as an individual, so I think, again, back to my distinction, as a founder, you would have equity in both. So as an individual equity owner in either of these entities, you have limited liability from the entity and being in multiple different limited liability entities doesn't affect that at all you have personal limited liability at the, at the entity level for all of those. So again, I think the, the crux of your question or, or the issue you should be thinking about to reframe it is what sort of restrictions might either business currently or in the future want to put on your time. And you know, or is, if you're in a C-Corp, for example, that's going to take venture investment, they might put restrictions on what the founders can do outside of that C-Corp in the future. So you know, having this side LLC hustle could become problematic from that perspective. But from an equity owner, limited liability company perspective, there's no problem in having multiple different types of entities. 
Uh, one thing I might add to that, uh, and it's, it's there's this thing called like a like a best efforts clause also, um, and I don't know if that, that is what you're referring to also, but like if you're signing on as like an advisor or as like if you're a founder, uh, the company might make you sign like a best efforts clause, which says you have to dedicate a certain amount of your time and hours to the to the company, uh, which effectively kind of addresses the situation of moonlighting. Like they don't want you working with other companies. They want you to spend all your efforts uh, with that specific company. So um, I don't know if that addresses your question, but um, yeah. So if you start a new company now, with, if you're going to be with a third vector, and you know, it's a company that's, that's, that's going to grow, right? It's not going to be just a lifestyle company. And so you file it in Washington, and then you go to get money, and the investors want to file it there, and they're not sure what rights you have. Should you just go to get investors and ask them to, to try to switch it, or should you know, talk to a switch it, or is it so cumbersome just from the get-go to file it in Delaware? Um, what's your overall recommendation? Like, you have to pick, you know, one happy path, best choice, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I think it really depends on your situation, and uh, I can't necessarily get into the nitty-gritty that Tyler can do, but uh, as far as, like, starting out, um, there is, you, you can definitely convert, is, uh, if, if that's your baseline question, but the conversion process might be a little more difficult. Yeah, so converting from a Washington Corp to a Delaware Corp um, early is fairly cheap and fairly straightforward. Later in the company's life when there's a bunch of contracts outstanding can be more complicated and more difficult and more costly. So if you think you're going to get pushed towards Delaware, moving to Delaware earlier rather than later is better. Um, sort of pulling back though one layer to you know something they talked about before there's a couple of schools of thought the simplest easiest way to clear your path for future investment is to incorporate in Delaware because everybody's familiar with it it's the most straightforward it's simple there are so jurisdiction by jurisdiction is different but in Washington Washington's adopted a corporate statute that's very very similar to Delaware's and there's have been some case law in Washington although this is a little contentious among lawyers suggesting that where there isn't Washington case law on an issue they might look to Delaware case law so basically no Washington inv venture investor has a problem investing in a Washington corporation foreign other state in venture investors sometimes do um, uh, you know, I've been involved in situations where we've warded off that by sort of explaining to the, them and their lawyers, the, the, the investor from out of state, what Washington corporate statute looks like and how it's similar to Delaware and all the case law. Um, but, you know, if you want to avoid having that fight and having that discussion, just incorporating in Delaware is easier. Delaware incorporation early on is not that much more expensive than Washington. Um, it's $60 a year annually in Washington, flat fee. That's what Microsoft pays. That's what a startup fee pays. In Delaware, it's variable, and it's kind of an annoying, complicated formula. But suffice it to say, at the early stages, it's $300 a year. So that's not a major difference. What happens is in years four, five, six, seven, eight, when you're growing and your asset base is growing, you can be paying a few thousand to a few ten thousand dollars in Delaware versus the $60 flat fee in Washington. So that that's the calculus. If you're someone who's extremely fee sensitive and you're trying to bootstrap every last dollar and you think you're likely to raise from Washington or California based VCs, Washington is probably fine. If you're someone who's risk averse and wants to take as many issues off the table and make it as clean and simple for a venture investor to invest in and you're willing to pay a little bit extra to do that, then Delaware, incorporating in Delaware is the answer. Is that helpful? Oh, yeah. So you can, uh, there's some, I think, some logic to that some people, they start their startup and they know that they're going to incur a lot of losses, right, like in their first year. And they're like, well, I want to get the tax advantages of offsetting my personal income on those losses before they ever think about getting financing. Um, and then when they have thoughts of financing, that's the, the concept. The actual conversion is very simple. Um, it's just you have to file a certificate of conversion. I think there's like a couple pieces of information that's already in your articles of incorporation. You pay a fee. Um, so some people want to do that. They want to get, they want to like, I want to take advantage of the losses at the beginning of my company. I know I'm not going to get investors. I'm already bootstrapping it. And then when they think about investors, then they start, they convert. So they are saving on the tax aspect. Do you want to stand a little bit? Uh, 
Of course. Right. That's right. But let me just put a couple finer points on it. So uh, the pass-through losses, you can only take on your personal return as uh, th those are losses. Those don't, those don't offset your ordinary income. So it's only if you have capital gains to offset that that's even relevant to you. So for most younger entrepreneurs, they don't have significant capital gains to offset. So that's not, you know, taking those pass through losses at your personal level is not really all that valuable. And in a, um, in a, LLC, I, I don't know if you're familiar with NOLs, net operating losses. So in a corporation, you can accumulate the losses from year to year, and there's a bunch of restrictions in how you apply them, but those NOLs can become valuable later on. If you're passing them up through yourself personally, you're not accumulating NOLs. Um, there's no personal accumulation of NOLs. So if you're not gonna take advantage of the losses of having a pass-through entity, I, I wouldn't probably recommend it. Uh, if you know you're going to get to a C corp eventually, anyways, and it's become much simpler in recent years, there are states have passed conversion statutes that allow you to more easily convert from an LLC to a C corp. But it's not without legal costs. There's definitely cost and filings and administrative burden associated with it. So if you know you're ultimately going to get to a C corp and you're not going to take advantage of the pass through personal losses on your return, I would, I would form as a corporation originally, and then you've got the advantage of the NOLs uh, accumulating. Now they're going to be small, small NOLs, but still, every every little bit helps. Awesome, thank you for coming. Thank you guys.